I thank him for having the passion and fight and will to teach and share his, his wisdom with us. David Berg. Oh, that, that was just wonderful. Hmm? That was just wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Um, if you need more time uh, to go on, it's, if you need a few more minutes, it's okay. You... <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Uh, is this microphone too loud? Oh, is it all right? Okay. Um, as you know, over the last couple of weeks, we lost, <laughs> we lost another great trial lawyer. Uh, when we lost Racehorse Haynes. I uh, started my practice in 1968, and I had huge amounts of spare time. And I would spend languid afternoons in the Harris County Criminal Courthouse watching racehorse trial lawsuits, and I would position myself in this green-tiled cafeteria at 7 every morning just to bump into them. Uh, I loved racehorse, as so many people here did. And he would, he would always say the same thing when we went to a funeral. He would pull up, he'd pull open the glove box to his car, the, and he'd pull out a bottle of whiskey and say, let's lift a glass to a fallen friend and comrade. And so, on behalf of everybody here, that's exactly what I'm gonna do for Racehorse. Robin Young reminded me that two years ago this October, about a year and a half ago, Joe made his final appearance, public appearance, on this stage. It was a fundraiser for one of Robin's charities. And they thought about the best way to bring him out. Should he speak, should he just come to the microphone and speak? And there must have been a couple hundred young lawyers there. And instead, Robin Gibbs, who is here somewhere. Robin, are you here? No, sit down, Robin. I just asked if you were here. I don't, it's my, it's my mic. Just, You will, you will note that throughout this audience, uh, there's Kenneth Tekel, there's Dick DeGarren, Dan Cogdell, Ronnie Christ, who I have to say something about because he gets angry if I don't say his name, Robin Gibbs, uh, and I'm so happy you got your license back. That is wonderful, Robin. <laughs> um, who am I missing? So, these were all people very close to Joe Jamail. Uh, we had a circle of friends. Uh, who would meet every Thursday, uh, once a month uh, on Thursday for lunch at the uh, Lexington Grill. And my son, my son, I bragged about the food, and my son went there and called me, and he said, Dad, everybody here is close to death. And I, I, I don't like my son that much anyway, so. <laughs> In any event, we sat on this stage, and Robin and I questioned, uh, Janet uh, introduced us, and Robin and I questioned Joe, and it was wonderful. He was 90, he was almost 90. Was that right before his birthday? And Joe was as, just as sharp as he could be. And I'll tell you a story about that in a minute. He was almost 90 years old. That month we celebrated his birthday. But in the course of one hour, he managed to insult and demean at least four law firms and 20 lawyers by name. <laughs> In 2014, the American Bar Association asked me to update a book I'd written called The Trial Lawyer, What It Takes to Win. I have a daughter in college. Buy the hard copy, hardback copy, please. Um, and I was driving around, and I thought I'd call Joe because for two years, 14 and 15, I worked on upgrading the book with, updating the book with procedural hurdles that we have to face uh, to get a case to actually to a trial, especially in civil cases. And I called Joe, and this is, turned out to be about three weeks before he died. And we traced, between us, we traced the history of procedure from 1791 to the field code to 1938, the passage of the, of the uh, uh, federal rules of procedure, uh, and then up to date, and he said, Any <laughs> I'm gonna clean up the language a little bit, any time those, and here insert uh, a compound uh, adjectival phrase that was his favorite word, businesses want to shut out trial lawyers. 
they invent new procedures. Well, actually that was a little beforehand. It was 2015, I finally, it was due in September of 2015, I read what I had written about all these procedural changes. I promise you, Beowulf was more interesting. It was really awful. So, I, I, Joe passed away. I called him on a Friday afternoon. He died on a Wednesday, I believe. And I felt bad because I had missed, he'd called me and asked me to go drink, have a drink with him, which we did once or twice a week, all of us. And he, I, I couldn't go. And I felt really terrible about it because I never said no to a drink or to Joe. And Joe said, uh, so I called Joe back on a Friday. And he didn't return my call. And as Ronnie Crist points out, who was extremely close to Joe, like, like an old married couple, they would be at each other's throats and then they'd love each other. Two great trial lawyers. And he didn't call me back and I knew right away something was wrong. So on that Wednesday, I let the family know I wanted to talk to Joe and I got a call from Joe and uh, his nurses uh, the day, this is the day or the day before he passed away, and he said, he said, who is it? What is it? I said, it's David Joe, and I just want to tell you one thing. I love you. And he said, thank you, and hung up. <laughs> I just want to establish our closeness right from the start. <laughs> he was magnetic, Joe. He had a personality that just drew you in. He, the day that we spoke uh, here on this stage, he, he spoke. When it was over, we talked about it, and he had studied the crowd. He said, you know, those young lawyers look depressed. And I asked him, I said, if you had a, a child or a grandchild who asked you if they should become a lawyer, what would you say? And to my shock, he actually hesitated and said, I don't know what I would say. And I have a daughter, uh, my uh, two sons' younger sister, who just to inform me today, she's pre-law. Judge Richard Posner wrote an article saying, the title of which was, Why It's Not Fun to Practice Law Anymore. He said it's become a competitive market. And competitive markets are not fun, but Richard Posner is one of the reasons why it's a competitive market. The entire Chicago School of Law and Economics has just cut the legs out from under many areas of trial law. So when I talk to audiences, and especially to young lawyers, I tell them, go try anything. Take part in depositions, focus groups, learn how to do this because it is, it is a dying art. Uh, the, uh, what we know, all these guys who, we, we, we calculated around that table that we had a thousand verdicts among us. Joe's calculation was that 980 of them were his, if I remember. <laughs> is that right, Ronnie? Was it 980, 990? I don't. So after he passed away, I, I started thinking about how I would update the book and what could be more important than capitalizing on a friend's death. So I, um, what's wrong with you people? So I went to work with Janet. Janet helped me so much. I can tell you right now, beyond any question, without Janet, there's no Joe Jamail. She is an astonishing lawyer. In the Pennzoil case, she put together an 87-page uh, cross-examination of the main witness, who you, I'll talk to you about, John McKinley, who was the chairman of the board of uh, Texaco at the time, the defendant in the case. And her insight and her hard work and her heart is just indescribable. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for all you did, Janet, and for that wonderful introduction. So, after all this time, I sent the book off to an editor, the editor for the ABA. He has sent it back. It should be uh, finished by, uh, I don't know, three, four more years. It should be finished this year and in the bookstores next January. So with that, let me give you a, just an over-the-top view of what this incredible trial lawyer did. And I will tell you that in the case that we just tried, my firm, where Zenobia Bivens and, and uh, Vicki Mary, two heroes of this case we just won, uh, his effect, he, his, what I learned at age 75, what I learned had a huge impact on me in that trial. And one thing that I, that I say to young people is the great benefit of this profession is you never quit learning if you keep trying to learn. So 
why don't we linger there for a moment? <laughs> this, this um, I think Harry Reasoner is here too. This was Harry in this picture. But Harry was very mean to me today. He, he, where's Harry? Harry's uh, relationship with Joe began and was cemented because Harry took over the appeal of the Pennzoil verdict. And uh, because I happen to think it should have been reversed, I've asked Harry to return the money and he said no. Um, this is actually outside of Grappino's where two judges in the back and several people here and I would meet and have drinks and talk with our, our dear friend. This is, um, I especially wanted to mention John Jeffers Jr., a name that's probably not known to hardly any of you, but John was second chair to Joe in this case, did a great job, and Joe always said he couldn't have won without, without John. John led a tragic life. Um, after the, He was a brilliant guy. He was a, a Yale Law graduate, I believe, and he stopped me in the hallway in the courthouse one day and reminded me that we had debated against each other in high school. He was at St. John's, I was at, Be at Bel Air. And he held it against me that, uh, he, with a smile that we had won. In my case, um, I lost, along with my debate partner, in the semifinals of the National Debate Tournament in 1960. It, next to Sacco and Vanzetti's conviction, it's regarded as one of the great tragedies of the 20th century. <laughs> but I, don't, I do not hold grudges. My wife uh, is a semin she just graduated seminary at Will this week. She's a theologian, and she's a forgive and forget Christian. And she's taught me something I never knew. I am a Jew. I will hunt you down the rest of my natural life. <laughs> if my son skulks out of here, it's because he's humiliated, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> 